nice to be with you again. We're on our third uh, session of how to become a loving person. Part of the beginnings, of, we'll talk a little bit about last week and get us up to speed, but maybe you're catching by now the idea, and my goal is to allow God to change me to, to become the kind of person that naturally responds in a loving way. And this is not something that happens uh, overnight. It's not something that happens uh, in one step. But it's a process of discovering how I am wired and made up and where are the parts of me that respond in ways that are not so loving or not so God-like or Christ-like and then figuring out how to allow the Holy Spirit of God to rework that part in order to align my life in a way that responds in a Christ-like manner. This is how Jesus lived. And if you want to take our model, it is to, to look at the life of Jesus to see, because most of his encounters were people were not the planned meetings. So this morning I got a meeting with the blind man, and 2 o'clock I meet with the leper, 3 o'clock I see the Peter and James. No, these were... These were encounters throughout his normal life, a day, that Jesus needed to respond from the way he was uh, made. And, and this is how uh, our, our goal is. So we're going to look at some of the principles behind that, and especially today we're looking at love that responds naturally. So that's our, our goal. But just to get, do a brief overview, remember the commandment that uh, Jesus gave to uh, uh, him when someone asked him what is the greatest commandment he talked about loving God with all of your heart your soul your mind and your strength and these are some of the parts that we need to look at and see how we can get those all aligned so that we respond with loving and then the second commandment is like this you shall love your neighbor as yourself there's no other commandment greater than these the challenge is is if I try to do that without um, um, with on my own, if I just try to obey and become a loving person, then I find myself in a whole different world. I, I'm really artificially trying to be like Jesus rather than stemming from a natural part of it. But to become a loving person, there are five components. We talked about at least four of them last week. But there's the, the heart, which is the will or the decision-making part, the mind, which is our thinking, the soul, which is the part that allows us to be an integrated person. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, the body, which responds out of habits. You know, we, we have a lot of things we do without thinking. And then our social relations. And this is when Jesus talks about loving my neighbor as myself. I'm impacted by the people that surround me and how to respond to them appropriately. So sometimes family dynamics get in the way of becoming a loving person. We can We'll look at that in another time. But all of these must be restored to their proper function and healed or repaired by the Holy Spirit to live a Christ-like life. Now, this is an interesting thing. When you think of these different areas, we're all different. We're unique, and our upbringing is unique, and we're all impacted by sin in various ways. So you will have to discover in which of these areas is the most need of repair because for some of you your 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 body is not the trouble you've got good habits you respond in great ways but maybe when you were being raised there was a, a, a an issue in your life that just wounded you so deeply that that's the part that needs to be repaired or maybe for you it's your perception of God and others and that needs to be worked on so you know, when the scripture says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, this is what it's talking about, is to discover in my life what are the, what are the, the sticking points of how I can be more Christ-like. So for me to outline a process for you is going to be different than if I try to line one out for you or for myself because it's a, it's a process of self-discovery of in which of these areas and in, in, in where do I need to spend my time to ask God to change me and to work on these things. And, and there's different things that you can do to help repair these different areas. It's all done by the Spirit of God, don't get me wrong, but there are ways that I can 
allow the Spirit of God to, to repair or to, or to heal, <coughs> depending on these different things. So as we're talking about these different components, ask yourself, how am I in that area? Am I, is that the problem in my life, or is there a way that I need it? And for most of us, we, have, we need it in, in all of these. But you'll discover where hang-ups are, where the, the, the parts that are not naturally being transformed, and then you can choose to uh, apply disciplines or other things to help you with that, okay? Last week we talked about loving God with all your mind, the part of the person where thoughts and understanding originate. It's where we think about life. Thoughts are under the direct control of the person. We choose what we think about, which in turn affect our emotions, and we live at the mercy of our ideas. Did you have, spend some time um, thinking about these false narratives? Because last we, we, we understood that all of us come to life with different or false ideas about what life is like from our culture, from our upbringing, and we need to look at these false narratives about God and others and the truth about Him, and this is accomplished by living with Jesus. It means to think about our thinking. Did you get a chance this week to think about some of these false narratives, you know, about why, what is the wrong thinking behind why I do what I do? And for me, I was thinking about it this week about just being in a hurry. And, uh, you know, just standing in the line at the grocery store. And, and why am I, oh, it was an auto parts store. Why am I irritated when the guy up there is, is answering the phone or talking to someone else? Or, you know, it's like, what is it about that that's irritating to me? Like, if you were just a better worker, if you would pay more attention to the people who are here instead of the guys on the phone and all of this, I, I, I began to ask myself, what is, it, what is my false narrative that causes me to, to be impatient and, and expecting that that person should be dealing with me instead of others or be more efficient or whatever it is? And, so that's the kind of thing, as I'm standing there, I'm thinking, why do I respond this way? And being in a hurry can be because you, uh, you feel like the responsibility for the outcome of your day is upon your shoulders, that you need to accomplish a certain thing, and unless you are able to get through this person or this situation, you're not going to get done what you need to do, and then life will mess up, your goals won't be met, my end of the month goals target's going to be messed up, I won't make enough sales. And, I got to get this and that and that. And, and so all these thinking goes behind that, that impatience that if this month is going to be a success, it's up to me and I've got to keep things moving and boom, boom, boom. <coughs> and pretty soon the false narrative is, is that if my life uh, happiness is really up to my performance. So this is maybe the false narrative that drives my impatience. So I say to myself, you know what? Jesus promises that if I rely on him and I put his kingdom first, that he will bring about the very things that I'm desiring about. He, maybe he can put me in touch with the right person at just the right time. Or that when I'm in that meeting, rather than my exact perfect presentation, it's that the Holy Spirit touches that person's heart and says, you really need to do what Steve's offering. And that partnership allows me to be way more successful than the efforts that I'm trying to generate through my productivity and impatience. You understand about that? So having the right narrative that Jesus really is going to help me succeed in my work today, or that maybe I'm here in this auto parts store because the guy behind me needs some, some interest rather than to get my job done. I don't know. What are all of these different ways of looking at life will help you to understand why it is you respond in a certain way. So if we can get down to those deepest places and and modify that to where I really am relying on Jesus to bring success or to, to be a fulfilled life. And I recognize that he will do that as I trust in him. Then some of these pressures begin to kind of lift. And, and this is what Jesus meant when he said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't want you to have to have the responsibility of all of this stuff weighing you down. So that's a way of thinking about transforming your false narratives into, into recognizing that Jesus is going to help you in your everyday life. Well, remember we talked about that and what way is my picture of God based on a false narrative? 
You know, we, these things come through our upbringing, through our religious training, what may be some of the na false narratives that I believe. If I'm struggling with a particular besetting sin or behavior, what false narrative is behind that behavior, and what false narrative about other people do I believe? So these are some things that you can think about, and maybe that's the area where you need to do some work. So maybe for you, your picture of God is really a good one, and, and other people, you've had healthy relationships, and so that won't be as big of a factor. Today we're going to look at, at loving God with all of your soul. And this is probably one of the most um, hard or difficult to understand parts of the component. But um, the soul is, it encompasses or organizes the whole person, interrelating with all the other dimensions of the self so that they form a whole person functioning in a flow of life like a computer operating system that functions in the background. When functioning properly, it makes the whole person function well and in harmony. Hello, Tony. The soul seeks integrity or wholeness, and when sin is embraced, the soul is fractured and is in need of healing or restoring. Sin always fractures the soul. And if think of it this way, um, Think of it this way, that the soul is what allows me to actually accomplish what, what I decide to do, right? So if I decide I'm going to today um, clean the house, then I am able to accomplish that whole process without something from within causing me to, oh boy, it sure would be nice to take a walk right now, or you know, I, maybe I need to take a break and have a Starbucks, or maybe, oh man, I've got to get home and pick up the kids. And so there are all kind of things that come in to keep us from accomplishing that which we, we set out to do. And, and the soul is the thing that's designed to help us to be an integrated person so that what we set out to do, we actually accomplish. And now I, I'm talking about very practical things, but think about things in your spiritual <laughs> life that you say, I, I, I really want to be like this, but you find that there's, there's something within you that's causing you not to accomplish that. So here's an example of a broken soul. This is the, from Romans chapter 7. Look at how, how this, Paul describes it as he writes this, a problem. And he says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate. That's what I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law is good, but now it's no longer me who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I don't find. For the good that I will to do, I don't do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. See you know what I mean? There's this brokenness. There's this war within a person. There's one part of him saying, yes, I want to do it. And then there's a whole other part that's blocking things. And you find you're just battling with this, with this inner part of you. So let's keep looking at it. Then he says, I find then that a law that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God. I know that's what I ought to do. According to the inward man. But I seek another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man or person that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This passage has been misinterpreted throughout the ages, and some people have concluded that it's really saying that the mind and the soul is good, but the body is evil. And so we just need to forget about my, the body, waste it away. After all, it's not going to go, uh, it's going to change, you know, the new body. So just forget about that and only focus on, on spiritual things. But what the, the purpose of that um, text is not that error in thinking. The, the purpose is to show that there is something messed up within us. And sin has caused this this breakdown of how we're, we're designed to live. And the design is that as we uh, will to do something, that the rest of us falls into line to, to accomplish that, and we work in harmony. And the thing that helps to 
bring all of these things together is your soul. It is the inner part of you that relies on the power of God. And if, if we talked early on in the Garden of Eden when sin came in, remember there was this covering that Adam and Eve had and they lost it. The moment that they, they chose sin, their soul became fractured. And all of a sudden, the connection to God did not manifest itself in the outward uh, acts of their life. Hi, Cheryl. Come on in. Sorry about that. You're in the, having to walk in the front, but it's good. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. I, that's the only problem with this room is you come right in. Oh, hi. How are you? So no, we, entering at the back. <laughs> forgive us for that. Yeah. Anyway, um, so you, you're catching the picture on this set. There is a part of me that needs to be healed or repaired in or, because sin damages my soul. And this is something that you'll have to think about ongoing. As Paul talks about that I, that I sin against my own body, that sin, when sin happens, there's, a, there's something within me that gets messed up. And that is part of it is this, your, your soul. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the soul is repaired and how we can learn to live in a, in, a, in a way where what God prompts me to want to do, I am actually able to accomplish. When my soul is repaired and I'm connected with the source of life, remember the tree with the root that goes way down deep, when there's the connection and I don't have anything blocking the flow of that life-giving fluid, water, sap, or whatever it is, then fruit will come. But if there's, a, if there's a breach in that whole connection, then I'm not going to be, be able to be fruitful. So we're going to look at Jesus, how he tried to teach that this principle needs to, to be God given in our life. Jesus, on this particular day, encounters a leper. And the story goes like this. A leper came to Jesus, imploring him, and kneeling down to him and saying to him, Lord, if you're willing... You can make me clean. And then uh, the, the, there's so much in that. I could preach long, lots of sermons when I won't do that. But the leper comes to him. And the leper is supposed to be banished. The lepers are supposed to be going. They're not supposed to be coming. They're supposed to be marginalized. And in the culture of Jesus' day, there, there were teachings about why a person received this, this curse of leprosy. The teaching was not only a, that he was exposed to a person that had leprosy, but there was a spiritual component to disease. And the people were taught that somehow there was a sin or a place within their spiritual life that caused them to deserve the, the illness. So people who received leprosy not only realized, oops, my life has just taken a big downhill bite, but they also believed that somehow they deserved that and God was meeting out the punishment for this wrongdoing. So a person who was sick not only was ill, but they were guilty. Somehow I deserved this. Or somehow there's something within me that's so messed up that God has chosen to inflict me with this disease. And therefore, the healthy people had a sense that, well, things are pretty cool with me. Because uh, obviously God's looking at it and he's saying, you know, Steve, you're, you're pretty good. But, you know, I'm sure glad I'm not like the leper. Because uh, that guy's got some problems. So there's all this whole dynamic that's going on with this young, this, this person as he comes to Jesus. And he says to him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He, he trusts in Jesus' power, but he's not sure about his standing before God because he has this sense of unworthiness. What Jesus does is, and this is interesting, he's moved with, what's the word it says? He's moved with compassion and we could spend a lot of our morning talking about that but this is how Jesus responded to people who were in need he responded naturally with compassion that's what we want to to learn how to do and how to allow him to change us to be that way but he's moved with compassion and he's moved with compassion because he sees this poor guy who 
not only is, is, is ravaged by this disease, but he's got this whole way of thinking about God and why he's suffering, and yet he comes to this Jesus and says, Lord, look, if I could just rely on your goodness, if you would be willing, please make me clean. And so Jesus says to him what? He says, I am willing to be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Interesting word that the Bible uses, that he wanted to be clean. He wanted to be cleansed. Cleansed. The leper, there was no way in his condition that that whole thing could be repaired by his uh, living a better life or trying to think about things in a different way. The leper needed a miraculous or a, a spiritual <coughs> cleansing or healing that came totally from without. And this is one of the examples of what we need to recognize that sin does to us. We are not just in need of thinking better and trying to live a life that's based on something that I can do. There's a part of us that's broken that only the God can cleanse, can fix. And that's part of it is our soul. Lord have mercy. Another story. This is a different one. Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road. He was begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked, what does it mean? So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now apparently in his mind, he had the idea and he knew that Jesus had the ability to cleanse and to heal. And so he begins crying out at the top of his lungs, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's crying this out, have mercy on me, Jesus. Son of David, and Son of David is, is a, is a um, kind of a uh, first century uh, um, uh, nickname for the Messiah because they believed that, that from the line of David would come uh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And so when he's talking about Jesus, Son of David, He's really acknowledging Jesus' uh, sonship, Messiahship. He's the, the Lord of, of the promised one. So he's saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who went before him warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stopped, stood still, and commanded that he be brought to him. There's this huge crowd, probably like the Rose Parade, people all around. And Jesus stood <laughs> He doesn't go over to him. He stops and he says, bring him to me. And he asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And this is a huge, huge, uh, when we talk about healing and what, how healing works, this is uh, critical to that. Jesus doesn't just reach out and have mercy. He asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And then he says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. This guy's blind. He's begging. He can't function in life. And Jesus says to him, receive your sight, for your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Now, the, the cry of, Lord, have mercy on me, is what we want to focus on for just a moment this morning. Because the mercy of God is something that is impacted by the way that we look at things. The mercy of God is something that is undeserved, right? When I ask for mercy, there is not anything that, is, that I feel entitled to. When, when you go before the judge and you're guilty and you say, judge, have mercy, you're acknowledging that there's nothing that I bring to this uh, encounter that I deserve, but I'm relying on your goodness to fix my situation. And this is a critical component to becoming a loving person. And we're going to see why in just a minute. Recognizing that my place is dependent upon the goodness of God. And my um, standing is, is based on that. So I would just ask for you a question for a moment to think about. Have you experienced the mercy of God? 
Has there been a, an occasion where that mercy has been a blessing to you? Has been a, a, an evidence for you? We're going to spend some time this week thinking about that, so don't worry if nothing comes to mind right now. What is it about experience God's mercy that is healing? What is it that when I see God doing things for me that I don't deserve is a healing element? There is something about the very act of God's mercy impacting on me that changes me. And this is where the right picture and understanding and, and, and our view of God is so helpful when we recognize that experiencing God's mercy is a healing element. There is a sense of that somehow God out of his compassion is willing to fix and to have mercy on you and me. There's a, there's a sense that God loves you and me in a way that he gives us mercy. And what are the qualities of mercy that draw you to the one who shows mercy? There's something drawing about this man coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, have mercy. And there's a, there was a sense that, that God is a merciful God and that he longs to, to meet the need of your soul and your life. So one of the things that we look at when we're looking at our soul that is broken and corrupted by sin is that we recognize that we come into this environment with a sense that it's my own um, part of my own choices that have led to this. But Lord, I'm asking from out of your mercy that you will, you will heal this broken person that I am. And that attitude of, of, of relying on the goodness of God to fix you is what brings a person into the kingdom of God. It's the awareness that my unworthiness is present, but God's goodness is so much greater that I'm drawn in. And there's stories in the Bible Jesus talked about. Remember the publican and the Pharisee, the guy that said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then the other guy that said, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this one who is all this bad person. And then Jesus said, which one went away justified? And they realized it's the one who, who recognized his uh, unworthiness. But it's not just my unworthiness. It's recognizing the, the mercy of God. It's, it's both. My unworthiness, I have to keep that in mind. But the goodness of God is so much greater that it engenders a loving response. And that's why I'm talking about this this morning in the context of love. Because to be a loving person... That love is an engendered response from my recognition of my great need. I'm a leper. I need cleansing. I can't see. There's parts of me that are messed up. My life is going nowhere. But the goodness of God brings me out of that. So when I will live with this awareness of the goodness of God, I respond in a different way. You get that? Okay, so that's the reason for talking about the mercy of God. Now... We're talking about the healing of the soul, the inner part of me, the part of me that is broken. And there's a process that we go through. This is a prescription for healing. And we, we do this when someone is sick or when they're in the hospital or sometimes when we have our healing services here. James 5, it talks about, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And this is the part of the, the discussion of that verse I always kind of had a question about, because, you know, oftentimes I, I prayed for someone in the hospital, and they were elderly, and, and they asked to be anointed in prayer, and I prayed for them and anointing them. But I just kind of knew this probably wasn't going to be happening, that they wouldn't be raised up and yet I'm thinking here the Bible says it so clearly the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and then the next sentence says and if he's committed sins he'll be forgiven and there was this connection with the healing and the forgiving of the sins and that's where I recognize that what the first part of this passage is really talking about is this 
this inner um, need for repair and healing. There's a healing of my soul that needs to take place. And, I, and as I was praying one day over with a person, the Lord just brought to me, he says, you know, I'm going to raise this person up. He will be one that, that I, when I call out that name of the beloved in that day and when, when the resurrection morning happens, guess who's going to, when the roll is called up yonder, he'll be there because uh, he has, his soul has been repaired. So then I began to look at this whole process of healing from a, a, the, the spiritual standpoint first because it says if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. And I'm asking for healing, but he's talking about forgiveness. And then um, the next verse kind of talks about the pathway to inner healing. And that is confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. And then it talks about Elijah who prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't and prayed that it would rain and it would. Talking about the effectiveness of prayer. But there's something about confession coming as a leper, recognizing that I'm so, somehow in need of this, and Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Confessing the fact that you are in this mess because of your own uh, choices and the bad ways that, that you have been uh, acting or acting out the, from the broken places of your life and you are relying upon the mercy of God. So part of what um, allows my broken inner person to be healed is confession. Have you ever heard the saying that confession is good for the soul? soul. Right? You've heard that. And it's because... The, the way that I receive the mercy of God is when I recognize I am a person of great need and God is a person of great love and I'm relying on his goodness to cleanse and heal me. This is why my attitude about my uh, need is, for, is paramount and the step for repairing the soul is confession. And the purpose of confession is so that I'll recognize that my situation is so great that it is in need of, of healing. So this is borne out, and we're going to look at that in just a moment and how, how Jesus illustrates this. But the prayer for healing, this is the prayer that, that the blind man prayed, Lord Jesus Christ, and instead of saying Son of David, we're going to, we're going to say Son of the living God, have mercy on me. Do you think that Jesus' prayer, that if we prayed to Jesus like the leper, that he would respond similarly to you and me in our place? So the Bible's true that God is no respecter of persons and that he, he will hear and answer the prayer of his people. What if, what if I prayed that prayer? The same as the blind man. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. What if that prayer was a part of my uh, salvation? What if it was a part of my transformation? What if I recognized my need of being more patient, <laughs> standing there in the auto parts line, <laughs> and I just say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. Something in me is broken here. I, I'm not quite sure where all of that comes from, but I'm asking you to have mercy on this person who's not acting in the way that you would act. Lord, have mercy on me. That's a way of confessing your sin, isn't it? I mean, let me just say something here that well, I'll talk about more in the sermon today, but guilt is not a productive thing. You look through the scripture, Jesus never made anybody feel guilty person that came to him, this blind man. And there was the guy at the pool. Remember, he said, I'm so old, I can't get in the water when the angel stirs it up, and I, I can't get in. And, and Jesus knew that that guy had a whole lot of sin in his life, because later on, he encounters the man at the temple afterwards, and he says, you know what, buddy? 
you need to stop sinning. <laughs> this is where you're getting yourself back into trouble because you keep on this, you're going to end up back by the pool because you're into some destructive behaviors. But Jesus never made the guy feel guilty. He just said, uh, take up your bed and walk. So whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But guilt is a tool of the enemy. Guilt, um, I'll tell you a story. One time we, had, we were building a church in the desert, and we had this group of volunteers. They were called mission church builders. They came to build up the church. They volunteered. They're retired contractors, and they, their RVs were all around the lot. It was just this big, cool thing. But they would say, on Sundays, we need the church members to come out and help us build you know we'll have work bees and stuff and it's hot in the desert you know and it's, we're in there in april and may and it's up to 90 100 106 110 and these guys are out there working but you know not many from the church were showing up really you know so the next weekend our head deacon gets up in front of the church says i want you to know i was talking to one of these volunteers and they said this is the worst attendance from any church they've ever held you guys none of you are coming out in the desert you need to you need to recognize we are the worst and it's you <laughs> well everybody's sitting there thinking oh gosh yeah man i need i should come i mean it's my kid's birthday but i'll all right i mean i don't want to be the worst so guess what the next sunday a bunch of people were there so I'm thinking, hmm, maybe this works, you know. I mean, I'll guilt them into coming and showing up. But guess what happened the Sunday after that? Back down to, you know, me and the head deacon. <laughs> so how's it going, Wilbur? <laughs> Just you and me. How that guilt thing work out? All right. So guilt is a short-term motivator that uses the tool of the enemy to motivate. Jesus never uses the enemy's tools. He only uses God's tools. We rely on the mercy of God. We recognize that it's undeserved. But we don't wallow in that unworthiness. We just recognize that there's something wrong with me. And I say, Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. But I do so recognizing that I'm his beloved son who's coming back home to the Father. And when the son tried to say, Lord, Dad, Dad, don't... Uh, don't make me one of your sons. I'll just be a servant. Just make me one of the servants. That's the guilt, you know. I don't deserve this. But Jesus is saying, well, I'm kind of preaching here, so let me keep going. I need to keep this going. Whoops. Hold on, short breath. Let me go to the next one. This way. Uh, one, now, here's another story. Now, I, I know I'm into stories today. Uh, Jesus healed another guy of leprosy. His name was Simon. Have you heard this story? This Simon was had leprosy, just like the little gnarled guy did. Simon had leprosy. He was a kind of a leader. He was sort of a big shot. And he was in the council of the Pharisees. But yet he had this disease. And, he, and to him, he couldn't figure it out because wait a minute, I'm one of the leaders, I'm one of the good guys, in fact, I'm kind of one of the church leaders, and yeah, here, I got this leprosy. So we have cognitive dissonance there. He didn't really get, because he knew he was a good person, but he got sick. And he, the Bible says, uh, trusted Jesus and came to him and became a follower of Jesus because he recognized and in Jesus there was a uh, he was the Messiah so he, he asked Jesus for healing and guess what Jesus heals him but the element in Simon that was missing was the element that the little leper guy had and that is Lord if you're willing you could be merciful to me a sinner what happened was Simon got healed but there wasn't the component of relying on the mercy of God. Um, so what ha looks like how the story folds out. So while they're at this house, Simon has a party to thank Jesus. And this is kind of a, another sign. You did something for me, so I'm going to do something for you. You know, you healed me, and now I'm going to give you a party. There was this sense of uh, payback, sense of... Uh, 
okay, now we're going to be even. You know how that goes. So he has this party. People come. And behold, a woman in the city who is a sinner, and she knew that Jesus was at the table of the Pharisee's house. That's Simon. She brought this alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. She too has been forgiven. She too has been healed. And her response is in this private way to anoint Jesus with this very costly stuff. Now when the Pharisee, this is Simon, who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. He's not talking outwardly. He's not even saying this to Jesus. But in his mind, he's thinking, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is who's touching him. For she's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, teacher, say it. You see the difference? The Simon gets healed, the little leper man gets healed, but Simon doesn't get his need. And so here's what Jesus says to Simon. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other owed 50. And when they had nothing to which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answers, well, now this, we're talking in theoretical terms, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, Simon, you have rightly judged. And notice this now. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you didn't give me any water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to her, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Because she loved, uh, and because they are forgiven, she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to him, to the woman, your sins are forgiven. So if we're the Think about this now. If we're learning to be loving people, Jesus is given a real important thing right here. He who, what is it where it says, but her sins which are many are forgiven, and therefore she loves much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So our, our, our loving response is in proportion to our recognition of the amount of mercy that God has given to you and to me. It's not just that he heals me, but it's my recognition of the amount of, of, of forgiveness that has come to you and to me. So if there, is a, if there is a reason for the conflict, if there is a, the reason why sanctification doesn't happen in a moment, the same way that justification happens. You know what this justification is? It means you're declared forgiven, not guilty. When Jesus comes, you're going to be in heaven because of his sacrifice. That's justification. And how, how often does that happen? It happens in a moment. The reason that sanctification ha doesn't happen in a moment is because each of us has to have this sense that I am messed up and I'm... I'm going to be made whole out of the mercy of God. For you to be a loving person means there has to be a recognition of my unworthiness and God's mercy. So the process of becoming a loving person is to acknowledge my great need and to acknowledge God's great good. And that doesn't happen automatically for my own good because that helps me to become a loving person. Does that make sense to you? So my, the process of becoming loving is based on, on my unworthiness and Christ's mercy. And those two elements, when I think about those in the proper way, without guilt, I become a responsive in the manner of love. My response of love is in proportion to the awareness of the forgiveness that I have received. I don't dwell on my unworthiness to the point where I'm in despair or fear. I'm not worried that I won't make it when 
when uh, Jesus comes. I'm not concerned about um, my future, but my response of love is in proportion to the awareness of the forgiveness that I have received and the healing that I receive. And so this is vital to, to receiving healing is to acknowledge that I'm hopelessly in need of the Savior. And, and there are um, the struggles that we have in life are, are partly what help us to, to get there. We all know the story of the butterfly. I remember the moth and it goes up into the cocoon and it has to struggle to get out. And the guys said, I'm going to try to help them and they cut the thing and then the little butterfly never makes it because the struggle was what helped them to, to be uh, strong. In the same way, my struggles with this uh, sin helps me to have the response of, 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 to God's goodness in a way that brings love. So we have an assignment for this week, and that is to consider the mercy of God. To, to recognize that if Jesus were walking by my street and the parade was coming by my front door, would I call out to him? <laughs> and if I were to call out to him and he were to say, Steve, what would you like me to do for you? What would I say? Uh, I'm pretty cool. Thanks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if that's the case, I'm like Simon, right? It was like, yeah. I got this need, but if you could help me with that, I'll help you with the party. We'll kind of, we'll go our way. Or, or is, am I deeply aware of the, the broken places that need um, repairing in my uh, life? Or I can say, Lord, there's something within me that is, I don't know. It's just, I, I'm not responding with love or I, I need to, I need to see you in a clearer way or Lord, help me in my, in my unbelief, whatever it is, but these are the things that this week it would be good for you and for me to consider. And so I'm going to ask you to repeat often each day the prayer for mercy and dwell upon the mercy of God. And this is the little sentence that I, I say. This is a, not something I do in my sleep or whatever, but as I'm going out throughout the day and I'm getting impatient at the line, the guy's on the phone, and he's not dealing with the person who's present, and I'm kind of irritated because I'm thinking i got to get going. I have a sermon. i got a class to perform. If I don't do the class, I'm going to be frantic. I'm going to be upset. Everybody's going to be thing. I won't have the handouts done, and i got to get down there. Or do I say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. And seek an inner healing of your broken soul that has been damaged by sin. And what will happen as you ask for healing is that you will be in a place where you are relying upon the goodness of God, which is directly opposite to what Adam and Eve did back in the garden. They were relying upon the mistrust of God and their own resources. But, but by recognizing your need, you are relying upon and trusting in the goodness of God. And you're asking for healing for the broken places. And you're saying basically, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And what is Jesus' response to that? Amen. Compassion. Of course, I'll, I'm willing. Be clean. That's why he says your faith has saved you. Because faith isn't something that we do. But it's this process of coming to God, recognizing our sin, that we receive healing. Now, lots, there are places where sin breaks in our soul, and some of us, it's when we're young. We've had um, abuse. We've had certain ways of being um, messed up from our youngest days, and there's very deep places of brokenness that some of us are going to have to really ask God to heal those broken places. There's resentments. There are deep places of, uh, of woundedness. This is not something that even through therapy you can work your way out of, but with the help of God, you can have those places healed. And there, don't get me wrong, therapy is a good thing, and it helps us to identify some of the ways and places where we can, where we can turn those broken places to the Lord, and your soul can be restored. So in order for the whole flow of 
river water to get, come out into fruit, there has to be this repair of the soul. There has to be a healing. And that's why Jesus needed to come to heal, to, to restore, to deliver, to redeem. All these different words are done. So you're getting the idea that forgiveness does not just happen in a book somewhere up in heaven. It doesn't mean that they erase me from the book of death and write me over in the book of life. Well, that's justification. That does happen. But forgiveness really plays itself out inside of me. It repairs the broken soul that allows me to function once again in a healthy way, connected to God properly, and then I find myself flowing out of a, of a healthy life. So... Um, I'm going to just ask you to memorize this little saying. It can be in your own words, but Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. And think about it as you have those broken places that you can acknowledge if Jesus was walking down the street in front of your house. What would be, if he said, what could I do for you? What would it be? And think about that and ask him in your own way to be healed of that. And sometimes the things are very deep and you want to call the elders of the church and they're going to come together and pray with you for these deep places of healing. You know, the other thing that Jesus did right away was he sent the disciples out to heal people and the, what's the second thing? To cast out demons. <laughs> You're thinking, well, what's all of that about? Well, you can look at this as another way of casting out demons. There are those those places where sin has totally taken control of you. And this is part of what the healing of the gospel says. Remember, Simon didn't really love because he didn't recognize this right here. But the little guy who, who was in great need did. And that's the key to becoming a naturally loving person. So when Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another... By this all men will know you're my disciples, if you have love for one another as I have loved you. So sooner or later, after we, after we are aware of our need and the mercy of God, what happens is we begin to respond to others the same way God responds to us. We respond with mercy. We respond without judgment, but with love. And because we've been forgiven a lot. And so that's a vital part of it. So we're going to look about that, that prayer. Okay, that's the end of the lecture. Now it's time for questions. So thank you, Ron. He's going to stop.